Hey everyone, I'm here today in room 233 to teach you a little bit about chemical reactions and how those reactions are expressed on paper or described on paper. Those are chemical equations. We'll go over some basics about what a chemical reaction is. We'll look at a couple of examples and then talk about the different parts of a balanced chemical equation or how those reactions are represented on paper. So let's check it out. Now what we're talking about when we're talking about a chemical reaction is when atoms or the things that all matter is made of, atoms are rearranged into different orientations or paired with other atoms. There are starting substances, which are called reactants. Those are the things that are at the beginning of the reaction. And they are rearranged, the atoms in them are rearranged to form products. Now the atoms are only rearranged. No new atoms are created. No atoms disappear or are destroyed. And an atom cannot change what element it is. And so if there is an atom of hydrogen in the reactants, that same atom of hydrogen will be in the products. It can't change to a different element and it can't disappear. All of those things collectively are called the conservation of mass. Conservation means that it's the same at the beginning and at the end, it's the same stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at an example of a chemical reaction and then talk about how it can be described on paper through a chemical equation. So this first reaction example is going to be between oxygen gas, which is in the air. Its formula is O2. And it's going to be between oxygen gas and methane gas, which is going to come from the faucet. Natural gas is made up of methane gas, and its chemical formula is CH4. Now, I can turn on the gas, and the methane gas and the oxygen are mixing now, but not reacting. When substances come in contact with each other that might react, one of four things can happen. Either they can react right away, and you would see it. They would react right away, but it would go so slowly that it might be difficult to tell that anything is happening. They might mix, but need just a little bit of energy to get started in their reaction, but then the reaction would be self-sustaining and no more energy would be needed. Or you might have to apply energy the entire time for the reaction to continue occurring, and as soon as you stop applying energy, the reaction would stop. This is the third of those kinds, and so while the substances are mixing, if I add a little bit of energy in the form of a spark, you can see now that they are reacting. The things that are being produced, it's difficult to tell, but there is water vapor being produced and carbon dioxide gas. This is not really changing the reaction, it's just letting more oxygen go in, and so the reaction is happening more quickly, more vigorously. So now we're going to look at what these molecules look like, we'll model it, and then we'll see how it can be described on paper or in writing. So that reaction was a reaction between two different chemicals. Methane, which is CH4, and oxygen gas. Single oxygen atoms are not stable on their own, and so oxygen gas actually to be stable is pairs of oxygen atoms bonded as a molecule. So whenever you read or hear oxygen gas, it means O2. Now these were reacting and they were rearranging their atoms to form the products. And the products were carbon dioxide, CO2, CO2, and water vapor, H2O molecules. It would be H2O. And you can see that if this was all that was going on, that this would not follow the conservation of mass, those rules set out about a chemical reaction at the beginning of this video. That the number of atoms, the number and kind of these atoms, does not match the number and kind of the atoms that end the reaction. Here you have four hydrogen atoms 
but only two at the end, and so it seems like two have just disappeared. Here you have three oxygen atoms in the products, but only two oxygen atoms, and so it seems like there is an oxygen atom that appeared from nowhere, which cannot be true. And so what really happens is that those extra two hydrogen atoms didn't disappear, but they became part of another water molecule. And so through this reaction, you had enough hydrogen atoms to make two water molecules. Now this still does not follow all of the conservation rules because now we have for products, four oxygen atoms, but for reactants, only two. And so what was really happening, for every one methane molecule that was reacting, it was reacting with two oxygen molecules and producing one carbon dioxide molecule and two molecules of water vapor. So let's see how you could write this on paper, how it is represented. So you saw that reaction between the methane and the oxygen. You saw models that represent it, but there needs to be a shorter way to represent those reactions because you don't always want to have to draw diagrams. You don't always want to have to use models. And so a representation, a way to represent reactions is through a chemical equation. We're going to focus specifically on balanced chemical equations to get you used to those right from the beginning. And so we're going to talk about the balanced chemical equation for that reaction and for that set of models, as well as all the different things that appear in the balanced chemical equation and what they give you for information. So like I said, a chemical equation is a way to describe a reaction through symbols. The symbols being letters, numbers, Greek letters, an arrow. You start off with the reactants. Sometimes it's just one, and so that's why I said reactant or reactants. And then an arrow, and then the products, the ending chemicals. And again, you might have just one product or you might have multiple products. In the reaction you just saw, in real life and model, there was this. So CH4 is representing the methane molecule. The 2 and O2 is representing the two oxygen atoms. And so these all were the reactants separated with the arrow to the products CO2 and two H2O molecules. So first, everything on the left of the arrow, reactants, what we started with. Everything on the right of the arrow, products, the things that you end with. And the arrow itself is called a yields sign, or sometimes means react to form. And so these things react to form these things, or these things yield these things. This part here, separated by the plus sign, and then this part, not including the two, this here, and this here, not including the two, those are all chemical formulae. And what a chemical formula tells you, it's the element symbols with these subscripts that indicate how many atoms of each element are in that molecule. I put molecule in quotes because sometimes substances are not technically molecules, but compounds or ions. So with this chemical formula, it tells you that there is one atom of carbon and four atoms of hydrogen. The four being the subscript. The definition of subscript here, it's the number that's after an element symbol, and it indicates how many atoms of that element are in that molecule. What is frustrating to chemistry teachers especially is when somebody reads H2O and they think the two is talking about oxygen atoms, but the subscript, the small number, is referring to the element that precedes it or comes before it. Though they're not here for element symbols, sometimes an element 
might be represented by two letters. It's either one or two letters. So here carbon is just a capital C, hydrogen is a capital H. If it's an element that's represented only by one letter, it will be a capital letter. If it is an element that is represented with two letters for its symbol, the first letter is capital and the second letter is lowercase. For instance, chlorine is a capital C, lowercase l. Another pet peeve of chemistry teachers is when students read it and they think it's a capital C and a capital I, but chlorine is a capital C and a lowercase l. Or iron, capital F, lowercase e. It matters, especially when you look at something like cobalt, capital C, lowercase o. If you did capital C, capital O, that means carbon and oxygen, that's carbon monoxide, which is a gas, it's invisible, you can't smell it, and it's toxic. Cobalt, capital C, lowercase o, is a magnetic metal, very different. So make sure that you use your capitals and lowercase letters correctly in your element symbols and your chemical formulae. Coefficient here represents how many of that entire chemical either were used up in the reaction, if it's a reactant, so two oxygen molecules, or how many of that were produced. And so we saw using the models that there were two water molecules produced. The two is not part of the chemical formula. The chemical formula for water is H2O. The two means that there were two of them. Now, molecules are so small that it would never be one of these reacting with two of these to produce one of these and two of these. We think about these more like on the scale of trillions. And so it's really that the coefficients are ratios so that for every one of these, there are two of these that would react. So if there were a million of these reacting, two million of these would react with it. One million of these would be produced and two million of these would be produced. So these are ratios more than just specific number of molecules. If there's no coefficient, just like if there's no subscript, it's implied that there's one. It wouldn't be that there are zero of these because if there were zero of these, we just wouldn't have even put the chemical formula. So no coefficient is needed if there's more than one of that molecule reacting. And last, the phase symbols. So here, G, 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 and G are the only ones for this reaction. There are four common phase symbols. They indicate what phase the chemical is in, whether it was solid, S, liquid, lowercase l, gas, lowercase g, or something called aqueous, which really means dissolved in water, and that's a lowercase a, lowercase q. Those are small in the lower right after the chemical and in parentheses. So we're going to take a look at another reaction that has a couple other things in it that this reaction didn't that will be represented in some equations. Now for this reaction, it requires energy input the entire time to keep going. And this is gonna be energy input in the form of electricity. This is a power source that I can control the amount of electricity going into these electrodes. And the red is the positive and the black is the negative electrode. The black is where the electrons are going in and the red is where the electrons are coming out. You can see as I turn this up, the small amount of bubbles are coming off of both electrodes. More bubbles seem to be coming off of the one with the negative, and some, but fewer, coming off of the positive electrode. Now what this reaction can also be used to illustrate is something called a catalyst. A catalyst is something that is used to make a reaction go more quickly or sometimes happen at all. And if I add something to this water that makes it conduct electricity better, then the reaction will go more quickly. So I'm choosing to use sulfuric acid, 
And so as I pour that in and it mixes, you'll see that the reaction speeds up. Now this is a catalyst because the number of sulfuric acid molecules that I put in is the same number of sulfuric acid molecules at the end. The sulfuric acid molecules are not breaking down or changing at all. They're remaining in the water, just allowing it to conduct electricity and allowing this reaction to occur. Now, as you can see, this one is filling up more quickly. I'm not catching all of the bubbles in here, so this should be a little bit more full. But you can see that it's approximately two to one if this were catching all of the bubbles. And you can see as I turn the power off that the reaction stops. So it does need continuous energy input. And the catalyst definitely made the reaction go more quickly. Now because this one is filling up faster and because it's on the negative electrode, it tells us what, that what is produced here is hydrogen gas and what is here is oxygen gas from the splitting of the water molecules. Now in that reaction, there were molecules of water that were present, H2O, and they were being broken down to form the products, hydrogen gas, which is H2. A single hydrogen atom is not stable on its own, and so it needs to pair with something else. In this case, it's pairing up with another hydrogen atom. Similarly, a single oxygen atom is not stable on its own. And so the other bubbles that were being produced were oxygen gas, which is two oxygen atoms linked. Now, looking at the reactant here and the products here, if this were the only thing that was happening, this would not follow the law of conservation of mass. We have two hydrogen atoms as reactants and two hydrogen atoms as products, so that seems okay. But we have only one oxygen atom here at the beginning of the reaction, but two here. Oxygen atoms can't just be created from nowhere, and so they needed to come from the reactants. The reactants needed to have two oxygen atoms. And the only reactant here is water, and the only way that we can get another oxygen atom is by having a whole nother water molecule. And so now this, to balance correctly or to model correctly, that there are two oxygen atoms and two oxygen atoms here, we needed a whole nother water molecule. Now you can see that by adding another water molecule, we have unbalanced our number of hydrogen atoms the reactants have four hydrogen atoms, and the products have only two. But similarly to how we added a whole nother water molecule, we could add a whole nother hydrogen molecule as well. And now this is balanced. It's that these things starting off, these two water molecules, were becoming two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule. That's why the test tube that was filling up with hydrogen gas was filling up twice as quickly. Gas molecules all take up the same amount of space, and so if you're producing twice as many hydrogen molecules as oxygen molecules, they were taking up twice as much space in the test tubes. So let's see how this all would look on paper, how we would write all of this balanced chemical equation. So the things in that reaction that were not needed in the first reaction. This reaction was different because we needed to add energy continuously for it to proceed, and we added that energy using electricity. Heat can also be used, but uh, for that one, it was electricity. And we also needed to add something to make the reaction go at an appreciable speed, and that was a catalyst. The catalyst, recall, none of those sulfuric acid molecules were used up in the reaction. If I poured in a million sulfuric acid molecules at the beginning, I'd be able to count a million sulfuric acid molecules at the end. They made the reaction happen faster, but they weren't used up. 
And the way that you indicate those things when energy is added or when there's a catalyst is you put them either over or below the yields sign, the arrow. If you can fit them both, you would put them on top. If there's only one of them required, you would put it on top. But if you don't have enough space, then you can put one on top and one on bottom. So here you can see how I've represented that reaction. I had two water molecules that were liquid, two hydrogen gas molecules that were gas were produced, and one oxygen gas molecule was produced. I had enough room over my yield sign to write the Greek letter delta, indicating that energy was added, as well as the formula for the catalyst. If I didn't have enough room, I could have put the delta and the H2SO4 on the bottom. I could have put the H2SO4 on top and the delta on bottom. But you can see here the definitions. The delta sign indicates that energy was added for the reaction to occur, typically either electricity or heat, more often heat, but in this specific one, electricity. And the catalyst. The reaction was happening without it, albeit very slowly. So thanks for making it to the end. There were definitely some things that were left out. This was meant to be an introduction, some basic information about chemical reactions and chemical equations so that you would better understand the different chemical reactions that we're doing until we finally get to our unit where we're really going to get into the details about how to write a chemical formula without having to look it up what is really going on and how to predict what's being produced. Like how did I know that in one of those test tubes it was hydrogen gas and in the other one it was oxygen gas? How did I know that it needed to be H2 and O2 for those formulas, etc.? So you're going to be able to take some shortcuts around those things until we get to those units where you fully understand it, but we just wanted to give you a heads up so that when you look up what's going on with some of these reactions, you can understand it a little bit better, maybe picture it in your head, what's going on with those molecules and atoms. So you'll be practicing this plenty in class, and I'll see you then.